Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Why and how to take the GCTI, the industry's cyber threat intelligence certification. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Robert M. Lee, SANS instructor and course author. If during the webcast you have any questions for Robert, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Robert. All right, welcome everybody. Much appreciate everybody tuning in in the afternoon. Uh, and of course, for those of you in the future viewing the recorded one, good luck. So what I wanted to talk about today was really kind of twofold. One. We just went through a massive update to Forensics 578, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, um, which really is the why on the taking the GCTI, and then to give some tips on actually taking it. Now, before I get into this, I'll give you a quick overview of who I am, but more importantly, I wanna, wanna say one thing right up front. I The information you learn here should never be thrown at GHEC. Uh, SANS and GHEC are two different organizations. I don't dictate what goes in the certification at all. Um, and so if I give you some tips and then you go to the tests and for whatever reason you don't do well, going to GIAC and be like, well, Rob Lee said, so it, it's not going to help you. They're, they're going to laugh because I'm not, I'm not part of GIAC. But given the sense that I, I wrote the course and the GIAC folks all came and took the course from me and uh, prepared the certification of that, I'm going to let you know what I told them and, and hopefully it helps you. Um, so as I said, um, sort of here's our agenda today. It's real simple. Uh, just what the update is and sort of who the class is designed for and, and sort of the why on taking the certification. And then I'll, I'll give you my tips on, on the certification itself. Uh, for a bit of background, for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Robert Inley. There's two Rob Lees at SANS. I imagine for all the rest of the time, I'm going to have to say that. Um, one Rob Lee is the Forensics 508 instructor, um, tall, bald guy. I am the short, fat, uh, bearded one. Uh, but I will give you uh, my perspectives in the world. So I, my background, I came from U.S. intelligence community, a large focus on looking at uh, critical infrastructure attacks in the nation states that go after them, um, but a real big sort of a, a follower and, and focused uh, effort on intelligence over the years. Um, so my background sort of scans both the government intelligence community world as well as the private sector where I, where I work now. All right, so let's first get into what's really going into this major update, what's going on with the class, um, what can people expect, and how does it impact the certification? So first and foremost, and don't worry, I won't, I won't PowerPoint you to death, um, but first and foremost, the class is really meant for everyone, and I don't mean that in some weird, like, oh yeah, I want everybody to take my class kind of way. Um, I, I actually wrote this class for the purpose of doing something a little bit different. Now, a lot of the SANS classes out there don't really focus on tools. They focus on tradecraft and it's a very sort of a uh, good uh, focus to sharpen your skills. So I think all the classes are, are good. Um, but my approach to making this class was very, very different than normal. Instead of here's types of tools and let's get used to the tradecraft on using these types of technologies and in different situations, um, my class is much more on structured analysis. How do we view the world differently? How do we become better analysts? How do we do intrusion analysis? Um, it's not really digital forensics and incident response focused. There's a flavor of that in the class, but it's also security operations. It's also um, just general intel out in the world. Um, if you are going to be doing more strategic level intelligence on like geopolitical analysis and uh, maybe even you know strategic level reports for executives or national policymakers, you still got to know this stuff. Um, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions in the industry today is that there is such a thing as a strategic, operational, and tactical level intel analyst. It's not really true. You might have a specialty, but you need to understand the entire process. Um, whether you're handling an incident response scenario or where you're uh, making that guidance for policymakers, if you don't understand how intrusions happen and sort of understand the entire life cycle of what goes into this and focus your analysis skills correctly across the way, um, you're going to be giving off some information that may not be as useful as you might think. Um, the world is much more than indicators. I think that's the other big misconception uh, is that Intel has anything to do with indicators of compromise. Sure, we'll show you how to do that in class and how, how to use them more effectively, but that's not the focus. The focus is on understanding 
or threats, understanding how to do analysis about them, how to look at them and view the world differently. We get hands-on in the course, we get technical, uh, because I think you should be. I don't think there's anything at such as a sort of non-technical intel analyst. You might have an interesting background. You might come from geopolitical or political science or law or economic background. It doesn't matter. You got to speak the language. So you may not be the one to pull open Ida Pro and start parsing through the malware, but if you can't ask good questions about uh, your collection sources, like, hey, um, show me the mutexes and malware because I want to look for patterns. If you can't ask questions of your collection sources, uh, you're not going to be well positioned to be an Intel analyst. So we go through all that. It's not a highly technical course. I think anybody with any background should be fine in the course. Um, it's structured in a way, again, that it's focused on analysis. So if you're an extremely technical person, maybe entirely different than the way you view the world before. If you're more of a fuzzy skilled background, um, or newer to the industry, you're still going to get a lot out of it from a different perspective. It's sort of a choose your own adventure, if you will. So when we think about thinking and we think about perception and analysis in the course, a lot of the update that I did for Forensics 578 was focused on injecting more of those classic intelligence processes in the course. A lot more different types of structured analytical techniques instead of just analysis of competing hypotheses. And really dove into understanding how we walk from one intrusion to all the different life cycle of what that's gonna mean. Um, of course, a lot of the course is really focused around threats themselves. It's obviously the title of the course, Cyber Threat Intelligence. And whether you're taking just the certification or whether you're uh, going through the updated course, please be aware that when we talk about threats, it is not, here's the malware, here's the vulnerability, because those are all just components of a threat. Um, really what a threat is, is those things that have those three options right there, hostile intent, capability, and opportunity. Vulnerabilities in your environment may be an opportunity. Um, the malware may be a capability, but opportunities aren't just vulnerabilities. Capabilities aren't just malware. And it's also important to understand that your threat is the human on the other side of the keyboard. So when we look at this course, um, sometimes people come in with the idea that they want to do a better vulnerability management program or that they want to um, be able to get ahead of malware. Um, you're going to be subjected to a lot more than that. Those might be good requirements. Maybe you work with a lot of vulnerabilities and you want to understand how intelligence influences uh, how you do your job. That's a perfect, uh, perfectly fine intelligence requirement. But the focus of the course is on the more the holistic aspect of that threat and understanding every aspect to it. Now, if you've ever seen me give any presentation on Intel, I do like to go back to this classic kind of model. And we do need to understand that um, data is not information, is not intelligence, right? You're, here's an IP address, that's a data point. Here's the IP address and it's command and control server for this piece of malware, that, that might be information. But that intelligence is gonna be high level context and really give me an understanding of context, action or inaction, and, and really um, an understanding of if I should care or not. And it's gonna be tailored down to who I am. But, but the reason I throw up this slide is some of the major updates in the course also relate to understanding our own shortfalls, our biases, and our limitations. Um, so when I look at this classic kind of intelligence diagram here, one of the things that stands out to me is, is of course, we all have different operational environments. We're going to be doing collection um, in different parts of the world. And my uh, Pakistani-based energy company isn't going to see the same threats as my U.S.-based uh, bank. They're going to have overlap potentially, but a lot of things are gonna be different. So that really goes to a field of view bias. Actually, consistently, many of us view our collection as pretty holistic when it's not. Um, why do we have a pretty good understanding of Russian, Chinese, Iranian cyber threats? Because we're doing a lot of collection in the US and Europe and intelligence agencies and, and private sector companies have traditionally done decently well at viewing the IT networks and those environments. And um, we don't see everything, but it's quite a bit. But what about the threats targeting Mali? What about the threats targeting China? I would expect years from now when we have Chinese security companies that really push it into the cyber threat intelligence piece, really making sense of all their security data, I fully expect to see much more understanding and discussion of the American and European-based um, cyber threat actors. Uh, when we start looking at South America, we're going to see different activity groups. Actually, the, the numbers, and these are numbers from Microsoft, by the way, uh, of around 320 targeted activity groups in the world, but generally only about 60 operate in a region. But the question isn't, do I just care about those 60? The question is, uh, what do I care about those other threats for? What am I going to actually take away from them? Um, the technical indicators, well, that's not going to be very useful. The Pakistani uh, threat breaking into the Indian energy company, 
I don't necessarily really care about the technical indicators of compromise. The infrastructure could be different. The malware is going to be different. The vulnerabilities might be different. But the trade craft to which they operate, you know, that might be important. The methods to which they do their job, that might be important even in my American energy company. Um, but it's not going to be important to my, you know, bank as, as an example in this in this scenario. So trying to understand what threats I care about, why I care about them, what aspects of intelligence and information sharing that I actually need. Um, how do I move from a single intrusion to of a company up to understanding what activity groups are, are targeting? How did Microsoft get those numbers at 320? What goes into that? Uh, what are the collection sources? What type of analysis is required? All these are questions that we address in the course, right? All, all of this is it, part of the major update as well is really focused on moving the course from where it was, which I, I was really proud and happy with, much more into including classic intelligence, um, structured analytical techniques, interrogating your collection sources, and making sure we can move through the whole life cycle. You see, you know, we still have models in the course that you might be familiar with if you've taken it before, uh, such as the diamond model. Uh, many people understand the intrusion kill chain, also known as the cyber kill chain. Um, some of you have been subjected to it over your career, I'm sure. Um, but the point of the model isn't about being predictive or structuring or a uh, link of the chain gets broken. None of that matters. The whole point of the cyber kill chain was really about putting data in the buckets. Can I use a structured schema to have uh, patterns form in front of me? Can I take command and control that I've seen across 15 different intrusions and structure it correctly so that if I start seeing a reemergent, a reassurance of uh, that capability or that infrastructure or that trade graph that I spot it and I can tie intrusions together and I can understand that there's a human on the other side of the keyboard that, that I care about. Um, that's things that the, the kill chain matters for, but the diamond model is a big one for us. And there's been more exploration of the diamond model in the course today um, after the update, which really just articulates that there's four components to an adversary event. Now, it's a very simple model uh, at its core. Uh, you should joke around with um, Sergio and, and, and a couple of the folks that made it, Andrew and, and Christopher, uh, and said, you know what, it, it's kind of just a box that you turn 90 degrees. I think that was the, pretty sure that Andrew and Chris both made that point to Sergio back in the day when they're making this, but but it's the dime model. So why is a simple little model matter? Because it's in its very core a structured analytical technique. It's a way that we view adversary events and try to extract out knowledge from them. If I can identify commonality in victims, commonality in specific things of capabilities or tradecraft or infrastructure, maybe I can get a better understanding of, of who's targeting me. I don't mean that from an attribution perspective necessarily, but can I understand that there is a single group or maybe a campaign launched against um, the defense industrial sector, uh, defense industrial base, um, stealing off F-35 data, uh, and I wanna get to that. Or maybe I have uh, you know, a retailer and they're being targeted with point of sale malware and there's commonality in, in that piece of malware that they're using and there's commonality in infrastructure of victims. Uh, these are things that I want to extract out and gather information about. Again, those individual indicators, they they serve the role sometimes. I think we're overly flooded with them and a threat feed has historically limited value, but key indicators that I've developed really well, maybe they're useful in scoping and understanding my environment, but but the knowledge about the threat, the knowledge about what's really going on, that's really what I care about. That's how I'm going to position myself well. Another aspect of the course that's been updated is really showing how to walk through that life cycle. So what is an activity group? What are the campaigns? What are intrusions? That's what are intrusions. Well, intrusions are any successful or failed attempt of the adversary. That always throws people for a loop. Successful or failed? Why do I care about failed intrusions? Well, um, the truth of the matter is if a adversary comes after your organization, and they try one thing and it fails, and they try a second thing and it fails, and they try a third thing and it's successful. That first thing and that second thing might indicate that those are their go-to playbooks. That's the first thing that they typically try at an organization. That's the second thing that they typically try at an organization. There might be more value in understanding and positioning against their sort of A game and B game rather than just what worked. If I'm gonna share out to the larger community, those failed intrusions might be uh, more effective for other people in the community than, than maybe even the successful ones. But more importantly, a lot of people today, this is many, 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 many organizations a day, play a little bit of whack-a-mole with their security. Got a lot of things going on in the SOC, got a lot of things going on in the IR team. It's understandable. And um, they're told, hey, do your job, do your security job. We gotta get through all these tickets. And what happens? Well, they identify something, they see a phishing email come in, um, they see a, a piece of malware on an in, in system, 
and they say, okay, well, this is this is all part of the same intrusion. Let's just fix it. And they'll reimage the system or clean up the system and put it back in the network and move on. That whack-a-mole styled approach, though, has, has a huge impact. Number one, we're not really learning from those intrusions. And the best threat intelligence is inside your networks. But the second problem is that might not even be the same intrusion. I might have identified the same adversary. They might have sent that phishing email, but maybe it failed and they actually didn't get in that way. Maybe they found an unauthenticated, unauthenticated VPN session coming into my environment and then put malware in the system. But that malware wasn't even their go-to effect. Maybe their go-to effect was using PowerShell instead just living off the land. But now I've been focused on malware as the threat and I thought I found how they got in, but now they're still actually in. I didn't kick them out, they're still there. And unfortunately, they're just using native PowerShell in my environment. So I uh, actually am not tracking them currently and they're sort of having their way with my network. Analyzing failed intrusions is important. I mean, extract a lot of knowledge out from those. Being able to tie together the real intrusions and understand what's really going on in your environment, that's important for how we position going forward and how we guide our security and security investments. But anyways, as we identify across intrusions, commonalities and patterns across either kill chain events or diamond model events or, or some other structured analytical technique way of doing it, once we identify that there's commonality in these intrusions and maybe there's a single, truly single kind of threat behind them, it's appropriate to turn them into intrusion sets and say, look, these three or four or five intrusions, they're linked. Um, we can pretty much do that in one organization. Any Anybody's sort of small to medium sized organization can typically identify intrusion sets. You've got enough data there um, to do so. But then we want to break outside of organizations and we sort of go a, a level above intrusion sets. We look towards campaigns and we say, you know what? Not only are there common intrusion sets here, but they're all in banks or maybe they're all in energy companies, or maybe they're all in manufacturing companies or whatever it might be. And we start tying in that victim analysis perspective. We're like, look, there isn't a campaign unfolding against the uh, technology sector doing research and development. There is a campaign unfolding against uh, political targets or dissidents. And we look basically at the mission focus of the adversary. And we try to have an understanding of, of where that is so that we can also understand our own risk and our own organizations, maybe in tangent industries. We have to be very careful with that though, going back to that whole collection bias perspective. If I'm doing a lot of work in energy companies, but I'm not doing a lot of work in banks, and I see a bunch of compromises in energy companies, I might think that the campaign is focused on energy companies, when in fact it might actually be targeting the banking industry as well as the energy companies. So in short, our, our field of view biases or collection challenges can unfortunately sometimes skew the way we view campaigns. And it might lead organizations to, to feel that a campaign actually doesn't impact them when that threat does. And we have to sort of stay flexible for those reasons because it might actually just be our perception is wrong. And then of course the group is sort of that human adversary behind the, the scenes that is running those different campaigns. One group can have plenty of campaigns throughout the sectors. Um, and sometimes there's multiple people on that team. Sometimes it's a cyber crime type group. Maybe it's a more national level adversary. Maybe it's the mix between the, the lines are blurring in terms of are these states, are these private companies? What are we seeing? Why do we care? What does it change things for us? Um, but of course, at the end of the day, we still want to detect the threats. So in the updated version of the course too, we go through um, moving past indicators. There's environmental detections that we don't really cover, right? Modeling, which is kind of like your anomaly stuff. Um, configuration analysis, which is like whitelisting. When we focus on the threat side of the house, uh, we teach how to move past indicators and get more into threat behavioral analytics. So how do I codify the adversary tradecraft instead of just the technical components of their toolkits? How do I stay ahead of that? I mean, interesting thing is indicators may not be relevant even between victims of the same group. So say I've got a group, we'll just make up a name, say cash register squirrel. So cash register squirrel is going after banks. Uh, they targeted 50 banks. The technical indicators, let's say there's 100% uh, of the technical indicators. Let's say that 70% that of them are not shared between those victims. So now we got to figure out which exact pieces of data are shared between the victims and try to make sure that that right indicator gets shared over so they can scope their networks and do forensics and try to understand the investigation. Horrible threat detection mechanism. It's actually a really bad idea. It's a horrible idea to do threat detection based off of indicators. It's a great idea to enrich your data and perform scoping to see how far flung uh, the adversary's capabilities or infrastructure are in your environment. So it's sort of after the fact, making good indicators off of intrusions you see for your incident responders, but sharing them wildly with each other in a threat feed and trying to do detection off of that. It's a very inefficient way to do your job. 
Um, but now if I sort of abstract out cash register squirrel and I say, hey, cash register squirrel, what they do is they find unauthenticated VPN sessions, they go over to your domain controller, they uh, use PowerShell, and then they move laterally around the environment. I've just articulated to you verbally here in the webcast uh, the trade craft of that adversary. There's some nuances to it, but at a high level, you don't really need to know every technical piece of indicator and data set around that. I've given you enough that if you went hunting in your environment right now or trying to perform detection on that, just given that simple trade graph right there, you could be successful. Um, that's really where we get to threat analytics. It's the idea of, of codifying trade craft and, and looking for that. Because that trade craft's not even specific now to cash register squirrel. Quite a, quite a few adversaries do that. The other thing, of course, in, in the um, updated course and really just for the certain general focus a lot on intelligence requirements. Nobody is really good at generating intelligence requirements outside of your intelligence teams, and it's a challenge for your intelligence teams as well. Um, if you go over to procurement, you go over to the SOC, you go over to um, the CIO and say, look, what are your requirements of Intel? They might all give you different answers. Um, some of them might just answer you to be kind, but don't know exactly what they want out of it. Um, so in the class, we also coach people on how to make good intelligence requirements, how to sort of position for your customer, even if it's internally or externally, what they should expect out of Intel, what they should be getting. And, and then you basically guide them and help them understand, you know, is, is this what you want? Here's what I think your intelligence requirement is. Um, is this something that you think would be useful to you? Here's, here's an example output of what it might be for you. And you can coach them in that way and they can get a good understanding of, you know what, yep, this is what I want, or no, actually, let me give you feedback on how to adjust that. And the other thing about intelligence requirements is understanding if your organization is ready to switch from consuming to generating. Everybody needs to understand intelligence. If you're going to be dealing with threats today, you need to have an understanding of intel, because um, that's simply analyze information about the threats. But the question is, are you getting everything you need from external sources? Not every company on the planet needs a full shop dedicated to intelligence. It's simply not all organizations need that. It'd be great if everybody had the same amount of resources to do that, but not everybody does. The, the question is, can you consume other people's intelligence? Can you have somebody in your company or in your organization smart on your organization and its requirements and able to weed through all the stuff that's out there to go and consume what you need to do your job? Or are you not actually getting everything you need? You're not actually satisfying all your intelligence requirements and you really need your own team to be able to go and do that analysis and satisfy those requirements. And that's really the, am I gonna to switch to consuming to generating? Um, so that's what we gotta be careful of and mindful of. And then also we gotta understand our collection management framework. So this is another aspect of the class we've updated to make sure that we really, really dive into. I think if there's three things on the planet that every company should have, it'd be a threat model, a collection management framework and intelligence requirements. Um, from the collection management framework, a lot of us understand, you know, hey, one of the original SANS 20 critical controls was know thyself, right? Know your assets. Um, have an inventory of what you have. That's great. That's the first step. Really what a collection management framework is, is what do I have? What data can it give me? Where can I pivot? And what kind of questions can it answer and how long do I have it? So I've got an endpoint in protection system. Awesome. So what do I care for? Well, it gives me some system alerts. Okay. What can I do with that? Well, you can answer questions related to the exploitation and installation phase of the kill chain. I can ask these types of questions of that data. Okay, well, if I have follow-on questions, what can I get? Well, you can get the malware sample to then go do analysis of that. Okay, well, and how long do I have to answer these questions? Ah, 30 days. And the whole point of the collection management framework is to do two things. I mean, there's plenty of uses for it, but the two things I really care about is, number one, can I look at my internal collection and understand if I'm well positioned to do investigations. So if I've got 30 days of host logs on my enterprise network, but I've only got seven days of network traffic, uh, not necessarily full PCAP, but let's just say any network traffic, and I'm posed with an investigation into an incident response scenario or a SOC uh, scenario or whatever, where I'm gonna need both. It, it's the type of threat actor where I'm gonna need both and the data that I have to pivot off of and start structuring is two weeks old. I'm really not gonna be able to complete that investigation. Um, I'm only going to have seven days of that network type data. So it's not it's simply not gonna be enough. Um, and I have a gap in my collection that's gonna make my investigation difficult. I might try to get around it, but that's a gap. And I might find that maybe I can address that gap with different investments in my security program. I actually don't like the idea that security is a black hole that just keeps on getting more resources. This idea of, of 
have I invested correctly in my security is, is actually an answerable question that intelligence should be able to help. And really it matters on taking your threat model, which we'll go over next, matching it up to your collection management framework and saying, look, do we have the type of coverage we expect? So that second goal of that collection management framework is, am I focusing all my detection? Am I focusing all my investigation practices on command and control? I would say I'd, I could walk into a significant majority of companies a day and find that a significant majority of their detection is based on command and control. Just the, the easy signal of noise ratio approach that the industry's taken. There's nothing wrong with sort of starting out that direction, but maybe I don't really have the good visibility into accident objectives or exploit and installation. Maybe I don't really have good visibility into the problem elsewhere. So what if the adversary does something really novel with command and control? If I don't have detection on the other components, then I'm gonna miss it. But even if they do something really, really novel, oh my gosh, we've never seen this trade graph before, some crazy exploit, but if I've got other aspects of my kill chain coverage, then I'm still gonna be able to detect it. And I can find one aspect of the investigation and pivot and be able to complete that investigation. So collection management framework is about revealing what I have, what investigations I can run, how long I can answer those questions for. It's about identifying gaps. It's, it's about really just having an understanding of yourself in comparison to the adversary. One of the ways I like to use this as well is, again, sort of with your threat model, make sure that your hunting efforts are guided by something like this. Hey, you know what? Let's do the instant response in reverse. Let's assume that our adversary is using X tradecraft. Um, our intelligence team comes up with an understanding of what the adversary tradecraft is that we're expecting. We'll do a comparison against our collection measure framework. Could we accurately detect this, collect on this, analyze this, and follow through this investigation? Um, if we can, good job, we've, we've invested correctly. If not, let's figure out where that coverage is. And then of course, uh, the other thing we really break into in the course a lot is the threat model and understanding, you know, so this is this is not a, a real good view of one, but what, what is my organization? What do I care about most? What are the, what's the tradecraft of adversaries that could do me harm? I don't wanna prioritize every single thing that pops up. Do I care about every vulnerability? Do I care about every threat? Probably not. But what's important to me in my organization? What are the crown jewels? And can I understand if we're well situated against what our threats are? Anyway, so these are all things we cover in the course. Uh, what I'll do right now is spend uh, about four, five slides walking through sort of the outline of what the updated course looks like, and then we'll jump right into the GCTI kind of discussion. So um, what, what can you expect out of the course and why does this matter? Even if you're not taking the course, it matters from an understanding of what's going into the certification. Can you be well prepared to take the cert? So. Section one, we really get in that classic intel kind of discussion. A lot of things we just went over. Threat intelligence consumption, generating intelligence, trying to make sure we do right requirements and planning. Section two, we get into real deep intrusion analysis. Again, I don't really care if you're a strategic level sort of mind or more tactical level. If you're a SOC analyst or a hardcore sort of intel analyst, it doesn't matter. You need to understand intrusions. You need to understand how to pivot how to combine intrusions, how to follow one successfully, how to tell if it's failed, um, and understanding your collection sources. The first collection source we get into is malware. Um, a lot of the Intel reports we see today actually aren't really Intel reports. They're malware dossiers, right? They're a deep dive of a piece of malware that was identified. We have to understand what that means for us. There's a limitation in, in some of that. In day three, we've modified it heavily to just focus a lot more on just focusing on the collection sources itself. Um, so in day three, it's what can I get from different data sources? Here's what I can get from domains. Here's what I can get from external data sets of other people's information. Um, a really cool lab uh, from Mark Parsons on TLS certifi uh, certificates, basically SSL TLS certs. How can I pivot across these to identify command and control of adversaries that I hadn't previously seen or been tracking? How do I store and structure that data? We got a nice little MISP lab there on getting hands-on and actually using that. So again, there's, there's, it's a, still, it's an extremely hands-on course. Um, I actually probably have too many exercises. There's four to six exercises a day um, to reinforce all the material, but it's all focused on that analysis piece. Um, section four, we really get into that structure integral techniques and building out campaigns. Um, we, throughout the course, we follow through an intrusion. We go from a single data point, literally an IP address is what we start with and we move it all the way through intrusions to intrusion sets to campaigns to an activity group, um, understanding and building those campaigns out. Then we have to share. We, sharing is important. Sharing is caring, right? Um, even if it's just internal to our own company. So we figure out how to do that at the tactical level. Um, IOCs can still be extremely effective for scoping and instance. 
how do we share it at the operational level between organizations and even internal to organizations? Things like campaign heat maps and Rosetta Stones to, so that we have a good view on what activity groups are active in our environments. And then in, in section five, really get into uh, much more around the higher order analysis. Let's really dig deep into the logical fallacies and cognitive biases. As the analyst, we are the human component of that Intel process. Let's figure out exactly how we think um, and, and what goes into that. And then we do get into the attribution at the end, true attribution. I don't think attribution is, is as effective or as useful as people think it is, but if we're gonna do it, let's think through how difficult it is. And I like politically charged events. I think a lot of biases come out when things are political. And so actually the attribution uh, sort of capstone exercise here, almost a half a day dedicated to it in this day, um, is the election influence. Um, talking about that, figuring out what we can and can't determine from public data uh, and having a real big sort of debate between teams on, on on it from an analysis perspective. All right, cool. So that's the updated course. That's what you can expect. That's sort of what went into the certification. Now let's jump into the cert. Again, I want to give you a giant warning. I uh, am not involved in the certification making process. I'll take it one step further. I have not taken the certification. I am not going to take the certification as the course author. I don't even think I'm allowed to. Um, simply speaking, I can't teach to the certification. I don't want to teach to the certification. Um, I author the course. I'm happy with where the course is. The whole thing was GEC came in, sat my course, and they sent analysts multiple times to get it right. Um, I was really, really impressed with how they approached the certification because I warned them in advance. This is a weird one. This is not your typical class. That's much more around analysis and that's gonna have impacts on how you do testing because it's kind of harder to test for analytical completeness and thought process and scenarios um, than being able to use uh, the tradecraft on technology correctly. So uh, I was very, very proud of the GEC team. They sent, like I said, multiple analysts multiple times to sit through the class. Then they opened it up to alumni of the class who helped write questions and tailor questions and take beta tests of it and critique it and, and rework it. And finally, they got into a place where everybody who's been taking it and, and uh, sort of emailing me after the fact has been extremely impressed. So uh, I, I've heard extremely, extremely good things about it. Um, to keep this extremely fair, since I did not take the cert, um, but instead I again, sort of was the inspiration for it, if you will, with the, the, the style of teaching that I did. What I wanna do is walk through that GCTI page and tell you how to in, how I interpret a lot of the things that they put forward as requirements and areas covered on the test. So the, the whole purpose of the GCTI is around structured analysis. Um, we needed a certification in the industry to set a base level lexicon, knowledge set, and understanding of intrusion analysis and intel uh, for anybody in any company. It doesn't really matter your industry. It's not it's not industry focused per se. It's, it's community focused. It's about the field of Intel, um, moving a lot of that art into science. So the CTI is really about codification of knowledge. It's the capturing of years and years and years of intelligence work by the community into the, the base foundation. I actually wish I would have had this class and certification when I was coming up as an analyst. This I, I, I'm very, very proud of this course. Uh, and everything that has become. So the the areas that are covered and sort of what all this means. First and foremost, the thing that I think is a little bit misleading, um, it's not intentionally so, it's just because there's gotta be a web page. is the who is the GCTI for? It talks about, oh, well, forensic analysts and responders and hunters and dude, it, it doesn't matter. If you are dealing with security, this is a certification that applies to your job. Um, and, and I know, again, that sounds very uh, boastful almost, but if you are dealing with threats, if, if your job is not to just patch, and even then I would argue it is, but, but if, if uh, to impacting that, but if your job is dealing with threats, you want to be able to have a good understanding of, of how the community is dealing with it. And, and that's the certification. Um, areas covered at a high level, you know, intrusion analysis, open source campaigns, all of that. Really what you got to focus on is the strategic operational tactical in that first bullet. It, it covers the gambit. It is not just a, how do I make a Yara rule? It is, how do I think through critically on, on campaigns at the operational level? How do I extract out knowledge for the strategic folks? How do I weave all of this together? The second thing over there is the requirements. So it's one exam. If you sign up for a GX cert, you usually get, I believe, two practice tests and you get the exam. The exam is 75 questions, pretty straightforward, two hours. 
Um, passing score 71 percent is made off the average of the passing score um, throughout the beta uh, and a little bit after. So if you think about it, the the normal person to sort of get to a a passing score is 71 percent. That's both good and bad. That means it's not an easy test by any stretch. Actually, the lower the score, usually um, the harder it is. Uh, so 71 percent is not as easy as uh, I mean, it's not, it's not as straightforward as that, but it's typically not as easy as something that has an 80 plus uh, percent score, but it is a very fair test. How would I approach the test? Here, here's how I take GX certifications and I have found this to be very effective. You've got to learn yourself, but here's what I think is good. I, I would of course take the class and what I would do once I leave the class is I would take a break. Just give it a week or two, digest everything, come back, refresh on the material. Usually a lot of my students leave and they notice that there's tons of notes in the book. Uh, you get MP3s of recording of the course. There's a lot to go back in and digest. I mean, every sand, every single SANS class is a fire hose uh, of information. I mean, it's literally a whole book that we go through in five days of, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, slides and then labs. So go take the course, leave a week or two, come back, um, refresh yourself, and without taking down notes, without structuring uh, any sort of guide, I would then take the practice test. I'd just take one without any help. And I would just look at areas that I'm strong in and where I'm weak. The feedback on the practice test will give you areas of improvement of what you should focus on. I would then go back and make an index. Basically, where is everything in the course located? Ah, the diamond model, we talked about that on slide you know, 40 of day two. And ah, the uh, ways to do attribution, the four different ways of attribution, how those approach, we talked about that on day five. Um, make an index with some information to be able to flip through the books quickly, but also capture the key points. Um, if you do it correctly, you won't have to use the books that often, if at all, during the test, you can mostly look at your index and it has the right context. It's not just an index of this is the page, but here's the key point. Um, I would also probably stay in touch with the classmates that you took it with. That can be helpful to sort of split up the index. But in truth, the whole value is in making the index because that's what reinforces it. You can take your books in with you as well as your index into the test. Um, when you go and take the real test, uh, that is perfectly fine. Actually, SANS has no problem with that. It's highly encouraged. Why do we let you have an open book test? Because if you're not extremely well prepared, it's not going to help you anyways. Uh, you get two hours to go through 75 questions. That's a fast, fast uh, approach that you've got to take. You don't get a lot of time to mess around. And then, of course, you don't have a lot of time to try to go look up everything from an index. So it's, it's there. We give it to you as an open book so that you actually learn the material and can reference the material and stay focused. Anyway, so that, that's my recommendation. Take the test, uh, take the class, take a break, come back, take the practice start uh, cold, go make your index, get an understanding where you're weaker, take the next practice test, feel good about it, go take the exam. I wouldn't wait too long though, so it's still fresh enough in your mind. Um, so the areas to which the exam focuses, and this is again, my interpretation of what uh, GAC has put forth, and these are areas that I approved um, with GAC. So they, they, they wanted my input and I gave them input on, on what they would do. Here's, here's how I interpret their requirements for the certification and, and what I would focus on if I were you. Again, there's no insider baseball here, but just what I would focus on. Number one, analysis of intelligence. The big focus of the class, as I mentioned, is analysis. So know your logical fallacies, know your biases, understanding how anchoring is different than congruence bias. Understand that we have collection biases, understand how that impacts our efforts to do intelligence. With campaigns and attribution, understand the difficulties that go into attribution, but understand what campaigns are and more than just what it says right there with campaigns, understand the whole life cycle that we just went through. Intrusions, so intrusion sets, campaigns, activity groups. How do we make these? Well, if I'm gonna articulate an activity group, what do I articulate? Ah, the four vertices, the diamond model is typically how we think about um, an activity group. Um, what are What's important about each one of those vertices? Ah, well, I'm looking for specific things about them, like spear phishing wouldn't be trade craft. I want something much more specific that uniquely distinguishes that activity group or campaign. Collecting and storing data sets. In that one bullet, we're talking literally about everything on day three. Here's all of your different collection sources. What can I get from them? What do I want to keep from them? How can I use that internally for my teams? If I'm going to share it externally, what are the most critical things to store and, and share? 
it's not necessarily every single domain, but maybe if I talk about how I can map it back to my collection management framework to complement the knowledge that I didn't have about an intrusion, maybe that's more applicable now for the certification. Intelligence application, basically that whole discussion on consuming, that would be day one um, sort of midsection when we talk about how people use intelligence. You as a cyber threat intelligence professional must understand how your consumer is gonna use it. Intel is not for us. You're not supposed to use your own Intel. I mean, you, I guess you can if you're also the instant responder, but but realistically it's for other people. One of the beautiful things about Intel is it's almost like a service oriented community. It's all about making other people better, not jumping higher, running faster, you know, doing, doing their job. Uh, we want to enable people to do the job, make better decisions. So how are they going to do that? Really understand and internalize how people use Intel. From the, the next focus on intelligence fundamentals, to me, when I look at intelligence fundamentals, it's not just about what it says there. It says like network indicators and stuff like, okay, that's good. Um, I understand how those are used and the limitation. But when I'm looking into intelligence fundamentals, I really want to make sure you understand the classic sort of intelligence discussions. That would be where that model I showed you fell into, that collection processing, um, exploiting the information, analyzing reduction out to dissemination. Um, it's where I want you to understand the intelligence life cycle. It's where I want you to make sure you you have an understanding of some of the definitions. Um, this test is not a very definitional based test, I've been told, um, but there are some definitions that are important. As an example, what is the definition of threat intelligence? That is something that I would treat as a fundamental piece of knowledge. Um, what's the difference between uh, an, an intrusion and intrusion set? That definitional focus is an important fundamental. Um, why do I care about failed intrusions? The stuff we went over in the first part of the uh, uh, WebEx, again, an important fundamental. Kill chain, dime model, and courses of action. Courses of action are, are important, but you don't need to know all the courses of action, or at least you, you might have to list them, I don't know, but you don't really need to dive deep into them. There are, are seven courses of action, but only the first two really apply to Intel. It's that discover and detect piece. And basically the idea that we have different options available to us at different points in the intrusion analysis. Those first two are the quote unquote Intel focus. Um, but I do want you to understand the kill chain and the die model and how they map together and how they're not perfect. They're not meant to be perfect, but how they are a structured model to be able to go through and, and do analysis on. Um, malware is a collection source. You'll notice that it is a standalone item. We just said that we're going to go through all those collection sources, but for better or worse, a significant amount of insight into the adversaries that we have today is from malware collection. So even though, again, I don't expect you to be a malware analyst, I want you to understand the value and limitations of that as a collection source enough that we've positioned it twice on the uh, sort of requirements here. Pivoting, that is a core analyst skill to be able to pivot from one data set to another to be able to say, you know what? I found an IP address in my environment. I'm gonna pivot from that IP address to a domain. Um, when I find that domain, I'm gonna look for uh, the ND5 hashes of malware samples that have been beaconing out to that domain before. Uh, so the ability to pivot from data sets, this actually also maps back to not only the collection sources, but my collection management framework. Can I pivot from host-based logs into my network-based data sets? What kind of questions am I gonna ask across, across those intrusions? And then the last thing is sharing intelligence. The, again, this is not meant to just say, hey, here's an ISAC model with sticks and taxi, and that's how intelligence sharing is done, but actually what matters in intelligence sharing, usually much more around knowledge and making sure that we have an understanding of what's making people successful or not making them successful. But it's not just a simple focus on, aha, here's this indicator I'm gonna put in the feed. I'm um, actually, hopefully in taking my course, you'll understand that that's certainly not the direction that we're taking the course. So. Just start summarizing up and then I'm gonna open up to a, a questions here. We're either gonna, in a few minutes short or we're gonna have a lot of good questions. So go ahead and start uh, priming your questions up here. Um, what I expect sort of in, in a top level view for this certification, I expect this is something that is relevant to a lot of people. Um, generally speaking, again, I think anybody can benefit from taking this class and having a certification. I expect that this certification is gonna do something really cool for the community in the sense that a lot of these terms, a lot of the lexicon or language that we're using and a lot of the ways that we need to communicate between organizations, it's choppy at best. If I call over and say, hey, I detected an intrusion and uh, do you have any, any information relating to this? Um, if I call my peer organization, I might have to be explaining my definitions and well, here's what I consider an intrusion. And no, that's a breach. Well, no, that's not an attack because there was no loss of availability. It gets, it gets dicey, right? So having a shared language as professionals is extremely important. And I view this certification as codifying what the language of our field is. 
Um, I also view it as codifying a lot of the analysis techniques and things that we use today, how a lot of these things are done. Actually, you'd be remiss, I mean, it'd be very difficult to find um, good intelligence reports today that are not using things like the dime model. They may not always advertise they are, but generally speaking, your analysts are doing exactly that. Um, so I view the certification as actually, again, moving some of that art into science. And then in taking the certification, it's not impossible to take it without the course. And the official stance, of course, is you can. Um, you try the certification just based on your own understanding. Uh, you don't have to take the course to do it. The GX cert isn't really tied to any one course. But I don't think that's a real fair assessment because the GX folks obviously came to my class to build the certification, which means that I definitely inspired, I was say inspired, but definitely brainwashed uh, uh, them into the way to approach this problem. Um, so you could take the course, or you could take the cert without the course, I would uh, not advise it. We're not in the business at Sands of making courses on foundational knowledge that everybody knows. It's usually about pushing the envelope forward some, which means there's not exactly a lot of books and papers and things that contain all this knowledge for you to get studied up on. Um, if you do wanna get prepared outside the course, um, either you took the course or you just want to get prepared outside the course. I would highly recommend looking at the CTI Summit videos on YouTube under the D for channel. I um, mean, you can just go find them under sort of Cyber Threat Intelligence Summit SANS. Um, CTI Summit has recorded presentations from every year that we talk about a lot of these things. And a lot of the knowledge on what's going on in the CTI community is actually coming through that CTI summit for the past couple of years now. Um, and it's been that, that sort of focus for the community. So that would be a great place to also amplify some of these discussions. I mean, as an example, I, the one lab in the course that I opened up to, to somebody to make outside of the author team was uh, the TLS lab. It was a beautiful presentation at the CTI summit, great research by Mark Parsons. And so I said, hey man, why don't you make me a lab and a couple slides for the course, we'll throw it in there. Um, so looking up that topic that's been talked to the CTI summit would be another great way to prepare for that section as an example. But generally speaking, come in and date the course um, and, and you'll be in a good position. I wouldn't freak out. Last thing you wanna do is start freaking out about these tests. They're, they're really, really fair tests. If you focus, pay attention and review and study, um, it, it's actually very, very straightforward. All right, so I'm gonna start winding down and looking at questions. I think we got quite a few over here. Um, last time I did a, my other course at SANS is the ICS 515 course. And I just did a deep dive on the, the grid certification over there. And I, I, I learned my lesson because I almost almost ran out of time and then I had like 30 something questions. Um, so I saved plenty of time this time uh, for questions and I'm glad I did, here we go. All right. Um, first question, has the on-demand course been updated as well? Yes, absolutely. SANS is actually really good about that. Um, to, I, I may complain about it as an author every now and then, but uh, it's actually really in favor of the student. Um, when I do an update to the course, I'm like, yeah, let's roll it out in the next class. I get a giant, nope, um, go update on demand first. I was like, ah, okay. And and I, I think it's, it's better for the students that way. Um, so the on demand actually is interesting. It's not in a class setting this time um, because of life changes for me and, and moving around and, and sort of scheduling. We had to actually do it at my house. So on demand is like unusually personal on this one where I'm like sitting in my dining room, like talking to people with nobody else in the room. It's totally not awkward at all, um, but it allowed me to actually go quite a bit more in depth uh, than just a normal uh, structure class setting. So I, I don't know, I, I thought the on demand was done really, pretty cool this time. Uh, but yes, it's updated with everything. All right, the next question is, uh, if I took this course back last April and you've done an updated, uh, should I retake the course? Will SANS give us a chance to retake the course? Great question. There are two things for those of you that are alumni, and if you're looking to take the court, or you're looking to take the certification, uh, the update went live in December of 2017. So if you took the course after that, you're good to go. If you took the course before that, didn't none of the material we taught you is phased out. Like so, all the material you had is good, but there's probably another 130 slides or so of like core material you should really know. So how do we adjust for that? Well, if you signed up for the course, or excuse me, signed up for the certification and you were an alumni of the course, um, I took the 130 sort of most critical slides that had knowledge related to what you'd be tested on, compiled it up for GIAC, and they made it into a uh, PDF. And for those of you that were alumni of the course that didn't get an opportunity to see the new updated material, but you wanna take the cert, um, they'll make sure that you get that so that you don't miss anything for the cert. Now, if you ever do want to come back and take 
uh, retake a course. I am 90% sure my next statement is the truth, <laughs> all right? So I default to whatever Sam says here, but I'm pretty positive on this one. Um, you get half off. So if you ever come back and take any SANS course and your alumni have the course, be sure to ask them in advance because I'm pretty sure it's it's 50% off the second time around, uh, which is considerable and awesome. Um, but you don't, you don't need to. You can take the cert and just get updated. Uh, one was on CEUs, and Carol basically answered that, but for the benefit of the audience, said, Carol, the CEUs automatically added into our accounts for credit, or do we have to manually do it? And they are automatically added. So if you're a part of the webcast you, and you use your SANS portal account, um, you automatically get CEUs for it. All right, so the next question is, what kind of baseline technical background would be needed for this course? Would you recommend another SANS course for a prerequisite? I recommend a technical course as a prerequisite. Um, I do think the SANS courses are leading, um, but I don't really care. As long as you have been exposed to technical training before of some type, I think you'll be fine in this class. Because even though it's a 500 level class, it's not meant to say, ah, you needed these certain instant response skills or certain network forensic skills. It's much more about you've been exposed to technical training before. Now, if you're a senior or junior, we're gonna take you down a whole different approach around structured analyst uh, training. And so it is it is a different kind of beast, which means you don't have to have set technical requirements. I've had policy analysts and geopolitical analysts come through, and in the technical areas, they're definitely side saddling with people in the class and leaning on them for help, but they still get through it. Um, so it, even though, again, the labs are technical, the other good thing is there's a step-by-step, picture-by-picture, click-by-click walkthrough on everything that we do in the labs. Um, so I, 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 I think the prereqs are a little high at times, um, just because uh, what we don't want to have happen is somebody that's never had technical training before comes in the class, um, never seen a command line before, or never seen um, a packet, and and they're just they're not going to get as much value out of the course because um, even though you don't have to be extremely technical to take the course, it's obviously technical complex scenarios of ambiguity that we're going through anyways. Um, so I would take any technical course and it'd be fine. Um, let's see. You mentioned the course has been updated. Does that mean we need to take it again? Oh, so I already covered that. Um, different question, but I think I think I covered your question there, David. If I didn't, feel free to post again a different way, but I, I think um, we covered it with, with uh, Michael's before. Um, how do I request the 130-page PDF? Um, uh, that is specifically if you sign up for the certification, talk to GIAC, um, tell them you're an alumni, and your GIAC representative will have access to all of that. Um, Who's teaching Forensics 578 in Orlando? I'm not sure. If you go to sans.org slash FOR578, the entire uh, listing of uh, instructors and, and courses available coming up are there. They usually advertise them out about two quarters in advance and instructors locked in a quarter or two in advance. Um, I do. It will not be me, which means it'll, it could be either Jake Williams, Rebecca, or Peter likely. Um, we we now have uh, like six different instructors for the course, which is exciting. Um, I I basically teach uh, five to six times a year on this course, and five to six times a year on my ICS course. Um, I'll, my next one I think is I also the CTI summit. I think my next one is the DFR summit. Uh, I usually try to take those. The CTI summit and DFR summit are awesome. Everybody should go. All right. Um, let's see. This isn't a question. I want to read this one out loud. Was it before reading it before? And I hope it hope it's fair. All right. We this isn't a question, but. We have people who are enrolled in the process of taking on demand now, um, and the lectures have the lectures they have available to them. No, I think so. Ch check. Okay, so I, I understand the question now. Um, it kind of is a question, which is good. Great, great point, David. So the question was. We have somebody enrolled in on-demand and it looks like the lecture is the old one. They might have enrolled in on-demand maybe before December because usually on-demand gets you like three to four months of access. So it could be that there's a lapse there. Um, however, that's an easy one to fix. Again, I can't speak for the on-demand folks. So that, that is a really easy one to fix if they're already in on-demand just to give them the new videos because it's already there. So for whatever reason, it does seem old. Um, basically, if you hear a bunch of students in the background and it's a classroom setting, that's the old one. The new one is me sort of sitting privately in my home. Um, go back to your on-demand representative and ask for the updated course. I I have never seen SANS be unreasonable about those kind of things, and that should be an easy, easy fix. What probably happened is, is again, if I was venturing a guess, is they just signed up before the update, so they just need to go back and manually update it. No problem. Um, okay, that whew, got through all of them. Um, not too bad. If anybody else has any more questions, throw them up there. We got like three minutes left before I start shutting it down. I can just like ramble unconsciously uh, for everybody if there's no more questions. Um, anyways, Unconsciously, so, Robert? That would mean that you're not with us at all. Do, do what? You mean sub, 
Subconsciously. Oh, subconsciously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Just> unconsciously. <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, I think typically speaking, a lot of it's always a blur when I give presentations. I sort of just snap into it. I feel like I'm just uh, teasing you. I feel like that that the Adam Sandler movie where he just kind of sort of snaps into it and he speaks intelligently and then he walks away and he's like, What just happened? No, it wasn't Adam Sandler, it was Will Ferrell and uh, old school, I think it was. Anyways, all right. So this is this is what you got to be subjected to in class, by the way. All right. Um, integrating threat feeds into a sim. Who stands out other than vendor X? I'm not going to say that vendor's name. That was that was good. I don't know if that was planted by one of the vendors. Um, so, look, here's my here's my rule of thumb of what I say about threat feeds in class. First of all, if you're doing something and it's working for you, don't discard it just because I said it might be the wrong way. I'm not a big threat feed fan in general. Um, because of the way they're used. A lot of people use threat feeds in the sense of let me do uh, enrichment of my data for the purpose of threat detection. Indicators are a horrible detection type. If you're using threat feeds from a let me enrich my data to get more context about what I already know or fill in knowledge gaps on intrusions that I'm already working or help scope my environment to almost like a forensics perspective, those are all good use cases. And there are many vendors out there that do a good job in providing those. Um, feeds, if they're used correctly. My rule of thumb for threat feeds though, is I should always be able to pivot into a higher level of context. In other words, if I'm giving an IP address and I get some context about it, I should not only have temporal information about like when was it malicious, because that matters, timing matters, but I also wanna be able to say, you know what, I need more context about this. This is this sounds pretty interesting to me. I'm seeing on my network, what can I do with this? I should be able to like go into a portal or right click pivot or wherever, to then see like a blog post or a white paper or a research paper, something to be able to give me more context about what I'm looking at. If it's a, here's an MD5 and it's a piece of malware and here's the malware's name and that's all I ever get, I'm not even gonna use that because it can generate more questions than answers, which means I'm gonna have a very inefficient way to run an investigation. So I could probably force it to being useful. But there's probably a better use of my time to get there. Um, so that's, that's sort of my point of view there. All right, well, that takes us up to the time and that answers all the questions. So. Hopefully this was useful to you. I look forward to seeing you all in class and those of you that are um, able to take it with other instructors as well. We got a pretty amazing cadre of folks. I wish you all the best on your GCTI certification. I'm pretty excited that we finally get a CTI certification for our community. Um, I use the word industry because a lot of this has turned into industry, but at the heart of it, it's still a community and I, I'm really excited where the community is going. So wish you all the best, good luck to you and take care. Carol, back to you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Robert, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. <laughs>